Okay, hi, I am Brian Cardell. I am a developer advocate at Agalia. And I'm Eric Meyer, also a developer advocate at Agalia. And we uh, just got back from the W3C's big annual TPAC event that brings together, I don't know, I, I would say like maybe 500 people were there. Uh, yeah, it feels was, about right. I heard it was at least estimate, a few hundred. I heard an estimate that was close to 500. Um, okay. Yeah, so lots of uh, working group meetings and things. And we thought we would do a show to discuss what that was like and what happened and what we've been doing the past week. Yeah, I mean, one one of the, it, from my perspective anyway, one of the important things about TPAC is it brings all of the working groups together, right? So, like, each working group, of the W3C, such as the CSS working group or the, uh, the uh, web accessibility working group or, you know, whatever working groups, they meet on their own schedule remotely, you know, uh, virtually most of the year. And then some working groups will ha have a few in-person meetings, but every working group effectively has an in-person meeting at TPAC. And it's a time where those working groups can actually have joint meetings so I'll talk about CSS because that's the working group I spend the most time in. But the first couple of days were almost back-to-back -back joint meetings between CSS and working group and whatever other working group. So there was a joint meeting between the CSS and accessibility working groups, um, actually a couple of different accessibility-related working mm -hmm. groups where things were discussed like, okay, we're talking about doing this in CSS. What are the accessibility problems? Or the accessibility folks saying, hey, this is an accessibility problem. It's it this presentation is an accessibility problem. How can that be addressed? But those, you know, it could be the the accessibility working group probably cross met with the spatial computing working group, right? And CSS and spatial computing could get together or um, you know, the whoever. And those I think are really valuable because yes, you can do that sort of thing online. Uh, and that does happen in fact, but being in the, having everyone in the same place, like literally in the same room and being able to sort of interact in that way, I think is really valuable. Then there is uh, on Wednesday every year, there is breakouts day, which is uh like a little bit more freeform, uh, people suggest topics and it's, uh, well, what's the name of this that, you know, I, I, the word I know is bar camp style, but there's another one. Maybe people don't know that one. You know? I, I think it's just unconference. Yeah. Um, it's an unconference. So, yeah. you know, people suggest different topics and then, you know, they align, they f find out which ones have support, which ones have interest. And then, kind of try to arrange them on a schedule where people can attend different ones. And so those actually, everybody loves those. I mean, that's, I think everybody's favorite day of TPAC. There's so much valuable stuff that happens there. And I, I kind of wonder if like two days of breakouts would be even better because what happened this year is there's just, there was like 13 separate tracks and there's too many things that are. Yeah, actually I just counted. It was 14. There was four, 14 parallel tracks and almost every track had something in it. And that, when we say tracks, they're just there were thirteen or fourteen concurrent meet, like breakout sessions happening. And so, yeah, I mean, that's not unreasonable to say. Maybe if we only had seven tracks per day, and we did those across two days, but even that would be crazy. And you know, we should say these are again, these are. Breakout sessions that were proposed by people coming to TPAC. Mm -hmm. And they could be, there are things like web documentation, discussing how to handle web feature deprecation. You know, there's, I'm, I mean, I'm looking at the schedule right now and there are things like mitigate threats for the digital credentials API. That was a one hour breakout session. Cookie layering, the digital wallet project in Taiwan, right? Mm -hmm. It's a sort of a, a case study of here's, 
what, how we did this. Harmonizing identity-related web platform APIs. Next actions for digital manga and comics. Yeah, that was that was a interesting one. I didn't get to do that. Was a big thing yeah. in twenty eighteen or nineteen. One it was one of those. Mm. Uh, w three C did a whole thing with the manga, like digital. It was very cool, actually. Um, yeah. So I wanted to follow up and and see, but I didn't get to go to that one because you know there are fourteen competing tracks, right? And um, exactly, there were at least three that I wanted to be in at any given point in time. Yeah, you know? yeah, there were ones like let's. There was one called Let's Actually Fix Web Notifications was competing mm -hmm. with Web on the Moon. Yeah, that that also seemed really interesting. I mean, it's yeah. kind of like out there, but like I wanted I wanted to go to that one, but it was like you said, it was up against something else. And I'm I don't I'm I'm trying to scan. Oh, uh, oh there was a one year update on partitioning the visited links history mm -hmm. was one that yeah. I went to. And that was actually very interesting and got pretty deep into the technical weeds of like what Chrome does and what they would like to do and how that might impact, you know, future technologies. I couldn't even follow some of it because it was deep enough in the weeds. It was like, here are the various modules and how they relate. And here's a great big flow chart of what happens inside the engine. Uh, and I, I was lost uh, at that point, but it was still interesting. There are just so many more, yeah. An interesting thing that I bet a lot of people don't know is, you know, we think about like W3C and what WIG or what WG, however you prefer to say it. I think a lot of people think about them as like completely disjoint, but you know, like the people who are working what WG also are involved in W3C and they came from like, originally it, it came out of W3C and they always have used like W3C stuff, like, you know, like meetings and connections and things like that. So, yeah. so all, you know, they all attend TPAC and there is come meet with the, what WG internationalization, people, accessibility, people, security, people, privacy, people, people who have things about web components, people who have things about CSS, open UI, right? Like, so there's a lot of interesting things happening there because, um, you know, a lot of the things that I'm interested in that I talk about ultimately touch HTML or the DOM somehow. And yeah. And so I, I thought those were pretty interesting meetings. Mm -hmm. And as far as the breakouts go, there were some that I went to that were, there were a lot that were, web components themed there's a lot of open web components issues one that i was really excited to mm. see make good progress is the cross root aria stuff i think we're gonna work on that this year um excited yeah. to solve that because it's really difficult that you you know we have this boundary where ids from the outside don't make sense on the inside this is a recurring theme that you'll see and there's a bunch of issues in css that are like this too like so you create a name in CSS for an animation. Where's that name relevant? Yeah. Yeah. I, I actually just found the list of uh, the different uh, quote unquote tracks. Uh, there was feature lifecycle, permissions, uh, identity. Those were separate. UX, uh, real time mm -hmm. web, AI, uh, web components, Wallets, standards, and web apps were sort of the quote unquote tracks, but a whole bunch of the breakout sessions were not classified in specific tracks. Um, so, you know, they, they were just, this is interesting. It doesn't fit into one of these categories, but we're going to put it on the schedule anyway. And we've just, we've marked certain ones like all the AI related. Uh, right things were marked with little robot symbols. So, you know, web and generative AI risks uh, was followed by web API for hybrid AI. And then uh, there was a demonstration of AI powered accessibility auditing, you know, things like that. But then like there was literally just a web components category, like, as I say, track quote unquote. Um, so, you know, 
style sharing styles with declarative shadow dom scoped custom element registry web components and aria those were some of the sessions from that particular track so yeah I mean, it was really cool um and really overwhelming and really exhausting i have to say yeah because you know you just there are breaks between but you just boom 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 and then there was always that you know well basically what i what i told people when people said hey what are you gonna do on wednesday i said well i'm not sure right now because right I went through and subscribed to all of the sessions that sounded like really interesting, not just vaguely interesting, but really interesting. And my Wednesday calendar looks like a game of Tetris that I am about to lose. Yeah, exactly. Um, because there were just so many things next to each other. And, uh, you know, eventually you have to, you have to pick, but yeah, it would be nice to have a little bit less of a tyranny of choice there. Um, yeah. In some way. Yeah. But it's, yeah, but that, that is difficult because you have five days and like the CSS working group did a full two days of just the CSS working group face to face. Yeah. Um, and two, almost two full days before Wednesday of the joint meetings. And, mm -hmm. you know, is maybe the answer if we did two work, uh, two breakout days is, only do joint meetings and don't really do a meeting of your own, but that then cuts down on the number of face-to-face -face meetings that some working groups can do. Yeah. It's always a real, yeah. it's a, it's a real challenge because. Yeah. So there is actually one that I missed that I really, really wanted to attend, which is, um, so seven years ago, I just looked this up seven years ago. I did this whole series on web speech. And I was like fascinated by web speech because it is one of the um, sort of lost things. It's like because of when it was created and how it came about there. It's like it's not actually a W3C rec track thing, but it has wide implementation. But the wide implementations are like kind of in the state of the DOM when jQuery was around, where it's like you definitely need something to paper over the inconsistencies. And also the API is not good. Like it, it lacks a lot of features. And so I, I wrote these articles and then I opened a, a thing for tag review, hoping to get it started. And then it went into some W3C process thing. And there was like, for years there would be like, Hey, let's talk about it briefly. And then just like kind of nothing. And uh, there was one about like, improvements to web speech and it was like driven by google and i was like oh, i definitely have to go to that and then uh, i couldn't and the reason i couldn't is because uh rob flack from google was giving his um breakout on the carousels patterns and uh people probably don't mm -hmm. you might remember the spicy sections experiments that we did we kind of backed off on that oh. because of some feedback that we got huh. because we we're looking for patterns to resolve the feedback that we got and it looked like this might be the way. And so we've kind of given Rob some feedback along the way. And, um, you know, in his presentation, there was a lot of discussion about using this for tabs and got some interesting and mostly positive feedback. So, uh, I'm really hoping that develops. Was that the one about doing carousels via CSS or was it a, a different one because there were a couple yeah, of carousels. Exactly that. I think. Okay, let's get in. Yeah, let's get into the, like what we saw and what was interesting. So this was a talk. Uh, sorry, a breakout, which I guess is sort of like a talk, depending on how it's structured. But this this was Rob from Google saying, "Here's a proposal for ways to use." But basically, sorry, here's a proposal for things to add to CSS to make carousels possible. Is that sort of what it was or yes okay cool and you feel like it's going in a good direction or at least it's in vaguely the right direction or um well yes is the short answer to that okay um i think that it's difficult because when you when we begin talking about this everybody including myself wants to say like carousels are not good like they're not <laughs> right. good. Um, right. And yet 
they exist and it it's foolish of us to say to just say don't do that you know i i have this reaction a lot like i had this reaction when cs's working group introduced the ability to reorder content without like saying how that should work for accessibility and then they were just like here's the best feature ever but don't use it yeah i mean one of the things i think we've learned over the years is that if you decide that a thing people are doing shouldn't shouldn't be done and so you don't like create a standard way to do it because it shouldn't be done then everyone goes off and comes up with their own way to do it and many of them are much worse like this yeah. actual solutions are much worse than if you had just like put it in javascript or put it in css or whatever right or or html for that matter like you end up yeah. with really terrible incredibly heavy uh you know only works on the latest browser kind of solutions mm -hmm. instead of well if we had done this at the time then yeah. you know 5 years ago then it would be very widely supported and it, and it could be performant and et cetera, et cetera. So yeah, with carousels, I think there's likely to be that discussion if, you know, if these proposals move forward to add carousel capabilities to CSS, there's going to be probably a, a discussion with some pushback, like don't add this crap to CSS. Nobody should ever do carousels. And I, yeah, I think the counter sort of the, not the counter, the response to that is, yeah, but if we don't do this, people will just keep doing carousels even worse, <laughs> right? Yeah, you, yeah, absolutely. And so we should make this, um, <clears throat> we should standardize this because if it's in CSS, then it's much more easily exposable to accessibility features, the accessibility tree, that that sort of thing. Yeah, and also there's a there's an aspect of this that is like, what is it, you know, like what, what is it mm -hmm. and how does it work? So like most of this is built on scrolling and scroll snap and new kind of sort of like primitives for like almost like paging through content, you know? Right. And then like, how does that work? Like making it easy to make that accessible. So I think a lot of it has to do with thinking about how you break it down. Like, should this be a new element or what is it? And right. the, the things that I wrote about when we started the spicy sections is that for a lot of content, like, should it be a carousel? Okay. No is the answer probably, but, but like design wise, if you're just like a designer and you like a carousel, like, should it be a carousel? My answer is probably like, Maybe it depends. Like, what does the screen size look like? <laughs> you know, how much available space do I have? Maybe sometimes I want to squeeze it into a carousel because it's like, this is a lot of information. And if you're on a mobile device, maybe it's like super easy to thumb through it. Yeah. And it like, you can just scroll past it really easily. Whereas like on a desktop, maybe I want to put it in a grid or something like that, you know? Right. Um, so thinking about it like that allows you to say like, well, it's a it's like a primitive like scroll and like we don't have a scroll element in the web. You know, that's a thing that's about design. There's a design affordance that we that we allow you to apply. And so, you know, that's where the analogy comes in here that I think is pretty useful. Yeah. And I will say like mobile is where I don't hate carousels. We don't think of them as carousels probably, but like you said, yeah, on mobile, if I'm if I'm thumbing through a page and I come to a section that it somehow tells me, hey, you can swipe sideways here to see different things. Like I'm okay with that. That works. Sure. <laughs> and but then on desktop, generally, no, thank you. I would much rather have them as a grid. And so yeah, so having all of this in let's CSS is what this was about. You know, is probably on balance a, a win. Um, because like I say, then things are more addressable from the accessibility side. Uh, mm -hmm. if they're formally represented, like the CSS object model can communicate back and forth with the accessibility model and mm -hmm. all that sort of thing. Um, yeah. So, uh, 
I thought one of the interesting um, sessions that I that I saw the visited links one the one year report like it, I, that I mentioned before that was that was interesting, um, and uh, I hope that I can track down like a copy of a, like a recording of it or some, you know, slides or whatever. But another one that I really was interested in was uh, a discussion about the HTML model element. So this is a, this is a proposed element for, for HTML that would be used to refer to a 3d model or a 3d scene, depending on how, what kind of terminology you want, but just, you know, sort of the way that we have video and audio elements that can refer to video or audio. This would refer to a 3D model and it could be a simple 3D model or it could be a much more complicated 3D model. One of the things that got discussed um, as part of this breakout was whether or not this was the appropriate structure if you have a 3D model that involves like animations and loops. Mm -hmm. Is it sufficient to just have a model element or would you need more elements? Do you want to represent that sort of thing as elements? Um, and also, for that matter, how do you manage partial content? Because 3D scenes can become very, very large in terms of the number of bytes that have to be transferred because the geometry is fairly simple. But most 3D scenes have a whole lot of texturing, and the texturing is usually raster images. Um, and even if it's not raster images, it's probably very complicated SVG images, or it could be videos, right? Like there could be videos embedded in the scene or projected on walls or whatever. And you could easily, I, I think the number they were saying was that these uh, 3D models can easily be 100 megabytes, which is enormous. Um, you know, nobody would ever. It's like, almost the size of a web page. <laughs> yeah, really. Um, yeah. Like, I wouldn't even put a 100 megabyte video onto a web page. And the way YouTube gets away with it is that they send little chunks, right? Each video is effectively chopped up into a bunch of like, you know, these little chunks and those are sent to you sort of one at a time. Um, or maybe in parallel, uh, if you have a sufficiently capable browser that supports that sort of thing in HTTP. But the point being, they're not just sending you 100 megabyte movie file. And so there were questions about how do we manage that in 3D scenes? Like, and they it got into discussions like level of detail, which is a, a rendering technique that 3D modelers already use, right? Um, and so there were questions like, okay, if a, if a model has levels of detail, do we specify such that the lowest level of detail models are sent first? And the scene starts to render and it might be like all chunky. And then as the higher level of detail models come in, they get dynamically replaced. Like, is that acceptable? Um, yeah, I think that's a thing on, on video as well, right? Like uh, the adaptive bit rate thing you see in even television. If you are watching mm -hmm. television, it's all digital these days. And sometimes yep. you can see it get a little bit blocky, but it tries to tries to keep up so that you can so that you can get everything so you might have like a super hd and you know you're getting regular hd or even like the lowest kind of or even yeah yeah sd, SD uh, right. because they're, they're trying to have it be a continuous experience rather than showing you 4k and then stopping for 30 seconds while the little exactly. spinner goes right which exactly. if you hit that in streaming you're like okay i don't have any bit right and i see it on youtube too right mm -hmm. um yeah you're watching a video and it starts out in, you know, 1080p or whatever. And then, you know, f for whatever reason, suddenly it's in 144 <laughs> and everything's super blocky. And, you know, if it's just something you're playing in the background or it's in your second screen or sort of background noise, maybe you don't care. Right. Mm -hmm. um, but if you're trying to watch something technical, it has lots of details. You might be like, Oh God, now I have to, figure out what to do. Cause if I just pause it, it's like the chunk that it sent me and possibly the next several chunks are all in 144. Yeah. Right. And I already have those locally. It's not going to send those to me again. So like, do I reload the whole thing? But anyway. Yeah. So those, these are the kinds of things that, that get discussed. And 
again, one of the advantages of having everyone in one place and having these, either these joint sessions or these breakout sessions is someone can say, okay, I'm going to talk for 45 minutes about the model element or more precisely, we're going to talk for 45 minutes about the model element, right? Like whoever suggested it might have a quick presentation of here's where we stand right now with this proposal. Right. Comments, right? And you could have, there's somebody from privacy and there's somebody from like the performance community and a web component expert and, um, you know, uh, you know, just someone, you know, people are able to say, okay, have you considered that 3D models could be used for fingerprinting in the following ways? Mm, yeah. Right. Or, you know, I'm really concerned about hundred megabyte models and their impact on web performance, both for the user and just in general, like, you know, we're already in some ways struggling to keep up with video streaming. Mm -hmm. <laughs> what are we, what are we going to do about model streaming? Um, you know, and then, and then someone like me could say, you know, is there a way that I could use CSS to change the color of anything in the model? Like I didn't say that because that, mm. they're not at that point, but you know, maybe somebody's really interested in being able to say, that the background color of a 3D model should be in their corporate primary color instead of mm -hmm. whatever the normal skybox is. And you're like, well, CSS has backgrounds. That's a background. Yeah, I mean, I think <laughs> I think that when you have meetings like this, you have uh, all this like cross, you know, that's, that's yeah. the whole idea of it. You have like all this like cross idea things like that start to come together. Like I think mm -hmm. I also wanted to go to that, but I didn't because there was something else that I went to instead. I don't know which one it was, but, but I, I saw in the minutes that uh, one of the questions there was like, well, those things that you were talking about, they sound in some ways like really similar to audio and video. And those are media elements. And that means like in the spec and from a IDL standpoint, like the parts you can touch with JavaScript, they have certain similarities and like, mm -hmm. should it be a media element? Um, right. Should, it, should and, it be a new kind of media? Yeah. And then, so you get people in there from, you know, what way who are thinking about that. And then maybe you get somebody in there from like CSS, like you who makes that comment. And maybe you get somebody from web components who says like, oh, well, yeah, I, I can appreciate how this is complicated, but you know, in web components, you can expose parts and then those parts, like you can have limited styling on. And maybe that's a way that you could say, in this 3D model, the background is exposed like this with this pseudo class, like it exports mm -hmm. these parts. And then, you know, you can not have full control over the styling, but whoever makes the model can like allow, can like expose parts. So maybe they expose a part that's like hair and a part that's <laughs> like, you know, skin and eyes and whatever. And you, you know, you can set their backgrounds and their foregrounds and could be yeah. interesting, you know, but those kind of ideas smash together in person much more rapidly. And, and also I would say get short circuited much more rapidly if they're like, if they're a non-starter rather than somebody thinking about that a whole lot and then going off and like writing a blog and, you know, doing a whole bunch of work and then somebody to point out like the obvious rub that you're not thinking of, you know? Um, right. It's helpful sometimes, you know? Um, yeah. And speaking of parts, wasn't one of the things you went to about DOM parts? I did not actually attend that. I, I was very interested that? in it. Uh, yeah. Okay. I have been interested right. in it for a long time. Uh, if you don't know, this is the, um, you know, a lot of people say like, well, why doesn't the DOM have like a templating kind of thing to begin with? Right. I mean, like you can't, the fact that you can't is why we have so many other solutions, right? Like we have to, you have to have handlebars, you have to have, um, they used to be mustache. Like I, you're, I'm dating myself with the ones I'm using here, but you know, Angular, React, JSX, um, you know, right. all, all of these uh, lit, you know, all these have some kind of templating in them. A lot of people then try to make slots be that, but slots aren't really that. Um, yeah, so this is aiming to be an answer, but it's more aiming to be like a primitive that could be used by all those other ones. Probably not one that you'll just use exactly directly. Huh. 
I don't know. It's very complicated, and both Apple and Google are interested in it, and it it makes slow progress, but it's probably 10 or 12 years into it, and we're not there. And there was something else that was going on at the same time, or maybe I was just in a really interesting conversation and couldn't go. I I I did want to mention, like, one of the most important things, I think, about TPAC is that you meet real human beings who are really interested and concerned about the web and probably in capacities that you're like, that are totally new to you. And, and you, you like, you find out that, Oh, there's these people and these people really could use your help actually, you know, um, uh, here's this really important thing that you like just totally never considered. Uh, and a lot of times I think it's also us bringing it, in the other direction where it's like us explaining to a lot of people why like it's really important to increase the sponsorship outside of uh apple and google i also give you a little bit of like inside baseball about like the breakdown of this so we said that there was like 500 and whatever right like 120 of those i think were from google um yikes yeah yeah i did not realize there were that many there were over 100 from google um and I don't know from Apple, I would guess more like 20, something like that. Uh, I don't know how many from Mozilla. I would have to guess it's probably also in, in the same kind of ballpark um, as Apple. You mean? Yeah. And we sent seven, I think. Yeah. Six or seven. And many organizations send one person, you know, um, I mean, yeah. Uh, many organizations send w- one or two people and they are there for a very specific reason. Right. Um, but yeah, you meet, you meet a lot of people and help make connections. Sometimes you can say, Oh, you should talk to X, Y, Z and you can help connect people on things. It's really, I think that is actually very, very important. Um, Egalia sponsors TPAC every year since, I don't know, 20 a long time ago 17 i think something like that yeah which is Um, now a long time ago yeah yeah um (laughs) so we're i think the only ones that have done that consistently for a really long time and so w3c has a new ceo seth dobbs yep and uh also a new uh c d o Chief Development Officer Sylvia Cadena. I'm, I'm probably I'm probably pronouncing her name wrong, unfortunately. Um, Thanks. No, Sylvia Cadena sounds about right. And because of our sponsorship, they asked to meet with me, uh, and we had a nice like hour long meeting about like the future of W3C and what we think W3C should do, and like what Egalia does, and I thought it was really nice. Um, yeah. That's really cool. So um, we also got to help hook up um, open web docs with Sylvia because um, mm. she was talking about like, she, she has a long history of like fundraising and things like that. And we were saying like, look, the way that all this stuff is funded is like, you know, look, look around at what what's going on here. I mean, like overwhelmingly Google, you know, and I mean, I don't want to, talk Google out of sending a hundred people. I think it's great that they send a hundred people. You know what I mean? Um, somebody has to fund right. this stuff and they're funding it and whatever the flaws in that, I'm, I'm glad that they're funding it, you know? Um, yeah. So, but we need, <laughs> we need a strategy for, for when things don't go right. And here's what happened with MDN and here's how we got open web docs. And, um, I would like, I really like to introduce you if it's okay, you know? And, uh, so hopefully that, hopefully that pans out and yeah, uh, like that can be a good, a good introduction. Yeah, no, that's awesome. Thank you. I mean, as somebody who's involved in open web docs, I'm a steering committee and governing committee member, thanks to Agalia's support of, uh, open web docs. Um, yeah, funding has been a, a concern um, like it is for everybody because turns out 
you need money to operate in our current economic what? setup. So it, really? it's, it's a thing. It's strange, Shocking. but true. I know. Uh, yeah. And that, I mean, that is like one of the things that I really got out of TPAC. And this was my first, by the way, this was my first TPAC. A lot of people didn't believe that. Yeah. I, I have a hard time believing that myself. Like a, yeah. a number like, of people were like, how can that be possible? Right. Yeah. And I had, I, I actually had a, got into a couple of conversations where people said, yeah, I, I think I met you a couple of years ago when you did that talk at TPAC. I was like, I'm glad that it hadn't made an impression on you because I wasn't here. Uh, yeah. Right. That's right. That's right. You did, uh, you did, did a, remember. uh, yeah. Like a keynote thing, right? Like you did a, a, a thing about funding, actually. Yes, I, I did do a talk. We're going to like that, and people should watch it, because this is a really good talk, actually. I, I, I like it, but yeah, um, I, I did a talk, that w it was a couple years ago now, I don't know, whatever, um, that I recorded, and it was played at TPAC, but I was not physically there, <laughs> um, because for various reasons, um, you, you can't always go. Um, so... Yeah, people were just, they were like, yeah, you were standing in a train station. And I was like, okay, yeah. <laughs> Clearly you saw the talk and you have now remembered that I was there, but I, I, in fact, was not. But anyway, the point being that was, that was kind of a rabbit hole side, sidebar to the idea that what I really got out of it being my first EPAC was in a lot of cases, I met people in meat space for the first time. Right. I started calling it, this is our first meet meet, right? Like people that I have been working with online for years, or in some cases, probably measurable in decades, um, half of more than half of open web docs. I was meeting in person for the first time, like I, of the four who were there, uh, Estelle is the only one that I had ever met in person before, uh, Estelle whale, who's, uh, one of he was a co-author on my book um but you know we had only met a couple of times before in person so we got to we got to hang out and i got to meet florian schultz and will bamberg and uh vinyl um in person and like hang out with them for a little bit and then uh kadir topal uh who's um one of the web dx community group, not chairs exactly, but he, he's kind of an organizer, met him in person for the first time. And you and I had a really good conversation with him and Pete LePage, who I hadn't seen in years, um, about baseline and about WebDX and about BCD watch and, uh, sort oh, of we should probably mention that. Yeah. Related stuff. Um, that was, I thought it was really interesting and it was, it was nice to be able to just have that conversation like we were sitting uh, on one of the tables on the terrace where the breaks and the lunches were um just like talking about this stuff that interested us all and that we all want to see pushed forward um and there yeah it's sort of the hallway track is what people who go to sort of more traditional conferences call it yeah. and this is it's the same kind of thing here i mean maybe a terrace track but yeah the uh -huh. most valuable thing the most valuable thing actually is that um yeah i think it's yeah. the you know you can call it the hallway track or also there's the like dinner and drinks track right where right things that are just even like whatever they just come up and you have an opportunity to talk to people sometimes you it's even you know people that you weren't even expecting to be in the conversation and really good stuff really good stuff happens. Yeah. It's, you know, you might spot someone who you've been meaning to talk to and go over and they're talking with a few other people and you're like, Hey, it's good to see you. And you're like, Hey, have you met da -da -da -da, so-and-so and this person, and that person, maybe some of them you have and some of them you haven't. And you know, what are you all talking about? And it turns out to be something that you hadn't even been thinking about, but suddenly it's super interesting because you're talking with people who are super passionate about 3d modeling or, digital identity or micropayments on the web and you just start absorbing. And maybe if you're lucky, <laughs> it's something that, you know, a little bit about and you can give something back to. And yeah, I mean, I think that's always at any conference, any gathering, the hallway track is really almost always the most valuable. Um, so yep. what else did we see? We're, we're coming to the end, but 
anything uh, else we had the like... hackathon was um oh it, yeah there that was usually happens at these is that there is a developer meetup mm -hmm. um but these are things that are organized independently usually so this year there was no developer meetup and part of the reason i think there was no developer meetup is this one was really packed because this was i can't believe we're only bringing this up now but this is the 30th anniversary of the w3c yeah and so there was like a a lot around that on wednesday i think in yep. the evening it was not wednesday yep there was a there was a, a gala or gala yeah. whatever which sounds way swankier than it actually was although some people did dress up very very spiffly yeah but yeah not everyone um not everyone but it was um, nice so I think it was really packed and that's why we didn't have like a developer meetup this time. Mm, okay. And uh, Alina Lape, who is uh, from Holopin, it's kind of an interesting mm -hmm. company that does like digital badging, not like to swipe you in and out, but like kind of like the old Mozilla badging thing, you know, hmm. like that where you can like, you know, you can create these like um certifications i guess is a is a use case where you can say like hey this person completed this and you have like this collection of digital verifiable things uh, it's an interesting idea i remember tracking it when mozilla was doing it years and years ago like 2012 um and so somebody built a company on that idea and it's kind of interesting but she put together this hackathon and it was just people from TPAC and she organized some money for some prizes and mm. pizza and soda. Yeah. It was, right. it was nice. I wasn't going to go to it. I didn't register for it or anything, but then I showed up late and decided to do it. Actually, I showed up late and I handed in a, a kind of a joke. I, I wrote a thing with Charles McCarthy Neville on we wrote it on paper and it was just a joke mm. and we handed it in. But um, then she like took it seriously and was like trying to upload it to the GitHub. So I thought, well, I'll, I better do a real thing. <laughs> so <laughs> yeah, it was short, but I, I used the time, the assignment for the thing was to create like a tutorial, right? Like something to educate. Right. And given that I was like short on time, I thought like, well, I wonder if there's like something that I know that like a lot of people in this room probably don't know. Maybe mm -hmm. I can at least do something that's educational. So it's interesting to them, but also helps promote a thing that I'm interested in <laughs> to get more eyeballs on it. And so I just um, pointed people to, I mean, it's very super brief. I pointed people to the GitHub for the heading offset that we talked about with uh, Keith circle on a couple of shows ago. Mm -hmm. uh, there's a polyfill for that and made people aware of, you know, the purpose that it's like literally the oldest problem on the web and that it's kind of making progress and here's how it works. It's like very, very simple. Yeah. And I, I didn't expect to win anything, but somehow I did. So that was cool. Um, yeah. Maybe I won because it was interesting. Like it yep. wasn't fancy. It was not fancy. I mean, it looked like Tim Berners Lee's original web page. Like it was not. It was very, very basic. But mm -hmm. I think it was interesting. So yeah, yeah. So I won some cool. Legos that I gave away. Oh, wow. which one did you win? I forget. It's like third place. It was like a space Lego oh. thing. I don't do Legos, and I I don't have room to bring them back on my on my. Uh, yeah. <laughs> It's kind of a problem with that sort of thing. Like gift cards are very portable. Maybe next time gift cards would be a better. There you go. Yeah, I, I know they were all space themed Lego, but I, I couldn't remember which set you would want. But there were some good entries, though. Yours and Estelle's mm -hmm. was very clever. Very clever. I, I voted for yours and Estelle's. It was very clever. Well, well we um, voted for yours. Or at least I did. So, so what do you want to say what yours was? Or do you want me to explain? Uh, yeah, so uh, Estelle and I did uh, a five-star rating widget, which Estelle had actually created, um, to be honest. Uh, but it worked without JavaScript, and it was specifically set up so that you couldn't submit unless you gave a five-star rating, because that's what our project yeah. deserved. Uh, but it, great. it used uh, like a JSON sibling and 
uh, the control state pseudo classes like invalid and valid and checked um, in combination. There was also has, which we didn't even try to tutorialize, um, but it was in there. And yeah, it just because the the idea was write a tutorial, right? And so Estelle and I, having written a book that's meant to be a tutorial and also each having done quite a bit of work on MDN, she's done quite a bit more than I have, but we've both done a lot of work on MDN writing pages that have to have at least some tutorial element to them in like examples. And she's actually written full tutorials on MDN. So we like wrote a tutorial kind of. Yeah. It was like super interesting to see the different takes on this. And like yeah. when I walked, when I walked in late, I asked a question cause we were going to make like, uh, you know, our kind of joking one was, it wasn't actually joking. It was based on an idea that I had, um, but it was completely fictional. And I was like, does it have to be a real thing or can it be like a thing that you want to exist? Hmm. And like lots of people were like kind of groaned, but I was like, but it seems like a legit question. And, uh, I think I wasn't the only one that did something that wasn't yet, you know, implemented in all the browsers. So you don't, you don't know It's to some degree it's yeah. like in process. So, yeah, but yeah, it's interesting. Like uh, Tontek did one on the A element. Yep, and uh, I can't Emilio and I'm sorry, I don't remember who was with Emilio, but they they did it like a fantastic one that was really cool. I think it won second place. Was that the dark light one? Yeah, it was like the light dark mm. dark light one, and it mm -hmm. um, was amazing because like in their demo they didn't realize until they were done with their demo they found three bugs yeah that they were able to report in, to yeah. other browsers yep. yeah. yeah yeah just in making Which that demo really cool yeah and then the winner I mean, it's, was... it's cool but it's not cool because we should have like there should already be tests and bugs for those you know um but yeah it is very cool um but still and then the winner nope. what what were they demonstrating I don't honestly remember what they were demonstrating, but it was like fantastically cool. Like it was like this whole like yeah. um, parallax thing with like, you know, look like Super Mario Brothers kind of. Um, kind of and hard, like as yeah. you scrolled, like the stuff changed and it was very involved. Yeah. Like I, I, don't, I feel like maybe they must have had done that somewhere else or something, you know, like and just had a bunch mm. of notes and snippets and things like Tontek said like maybe all of his styling and everything was stuff that he had already done so he did like he just had to write the tutorial part and follow that mm. guidebook that he had for himself you know right um but yeah it was i mean it was fun in the end it was nice to do that but i think also maybe it leads to the last thing that i want to say about events like this is that um i i don't know about you but i am not super social in my regular day-to-day -day life <laughs> and yeah. like i have even social anxiety and man this is a lot i mean you're on from the time you wake up until the time you go to bed you know you're you're yeah just you're about. social 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 and um in meetings and it's for, for me i don't know it, it's draining like i'm tired mm. like i'm my brain is tired today. Like I, I almost, if we were not doing this, I might have just been like, I need a day. Like, <laughs> mm. yeah. Yeah. It, it is for people who are not naturally extroverts and mm. you and I are not. Yeah. It can be very draining. Like the social batteries get real depleted. Um, and it, yeah, I guess to the point where, okay, the meetings are actually kind of a recharge moment <laughs> because you're not necessarily talking to anyone else. You're just, you're listening and maybe you're taking notes or whatever. Uh, but yeah. And at the same time, it is the kind of social interaction that even though it may be draining, you're not skipping any of it if you can possibly avoid it. Right. Like, you know, you're sitting with people at lunch, you know, anyone could have taken up and maybe some people did take a, like a plate and then, not sit with a table of other people, like sit off to the side or take it up to their room or whatever, if they're staying at that hotel. Um, and that's always an option. And yet it was never an option. I think that either of us took, um, there were, I think there was one night, was it Monday night? 
I think it was, yeah, I think Monday night after dinner, some people were going to the bar and I was like, yeah, no, I'm, I'm going back to my room. Thanks. I appreciate it. But I, I yeah. need to go, I need to go do some stuff. And the stuff that I needed to go do was just decompress. Um, but for the most part, yeah. Like, That's like the kind of flip side of this is that while like, it's a weird contradiction because like I come back and I'm so drained, but also I'm mm -hmm. like so energized about the web and the topics and the, you know, like, right. Yeah. The thing I'm energized about is like maybe emotionally, you know, like mm -hmm. it can feel really a lot of the things that we work on, you know, they, they span years, you know, and mm -hmm. It can feel yeah. like, oh my God, there's so much stuff and it doesn't feel like any of it is moving. And it's just like really <laughs> disheartening. And like, maybe these people are just like blocking me. Like, um, and then you, you get together and a bunch of stuff happens and you see momentum and like you, you meet with the people who you feel like might be blocking and they're like, clearly not. They're just also really busy. And yeah, I don't know. I, I find it a, a strange contradiction in a way that it's like, my social battery is so drained at the end of it, but I'm also somehow really energized. So socially drained, but professionally revved up. Yeah. So let's wrap it up. <laughs> yeah. I, I don't know that there's anything else left to say. I think that's kind of, that's TPAC. I mean, in, in part of the thing about, part of the thing about TPAC is that we could probably keep talking for hours about, there are things we could say for hours, but at the same time that gets into the weeds. And if anyone's like really interested uh, in, what your favorite working group did during TPAC, go to see uh, if they have any notes uh, from meetings. Uh, most of them, I think, were were captured uh, in one way or another, some of them into actual uh, GitHub issues and others sort of to the working group pages. So yeah, look for those. Um, yeah, we'll link to the TPAC site and you can kind of surf around and maybe find the minutes. Um, hmm. Yeah. Awesome. So, well, it was good to see you in TPAC, sir. And, yeah, definitely good to see you and to hang out and yep. to eat some good food with you. Indeed. So, uh, we'll, till the next time. Till next time.